Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhoff for the Public Health Office from Douglas County. Uh, this is our update for July the 24th, Friday. And uh, just as usual, I model some kind of face protection here. Uh, this is a new one here. This is a glasses and shield thing together, and it works pretty well. I've got a very long nose, unfortunately, and it does poke into it. But I think for those of you who would have normal-sized noses, this would actually be a very comfortable and very effective kind of face shield to wear. So again, we're going to be trying different things out, different times, and people should try different things out. Uh, you may find you prefer a mask, the balaclava, face shield like this, but still I encourage you to do some face protection. So as typical, we'll talk about the, the outbreak here. It's still an incredibly, incredibly active outbreak. We're now 15 million cases in the world. We've added 5 million cases just since July, the 1st of July. So this has really been an incredibly active month. We were over 250,000 cases a day for each of the last two days. So a very active pandemic, still very active in the U.S., very active in Brazil, although we think the numbers in Brazil are being suppressed. Uh, they're doing a lot less testing these days, and we think they're doing less testing, so finding fewer cases. But there was an absolutely horrific view of a, of a field uh, with dug mass graves in Brazil. So it's really very problematic there. Also in Peru, which is, uh, even though a relatively small country, has about the fifth highest rate in the world. Also, lots of cases in this last week in India. And again, we talk about India a lot because it's a very big, very populous, very densely crowded co country. And so we worry that, um, that it's going to really spread. In the U.S., we're over 4 million cases now and over 145,000 deaths. So it's still very active in the U.S. And it's mostly active, again, still in the areas we'd seen before in California, Texas, Florida. But we're also seeing other places in the south, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, start to get really, really, really active. And that's a worry because, as you remember, Louisiana had a big outbreak in uh uh, early March, and they thought they were sort of done with this, but now they're starting to see another very large outbreak in the Louisiana area. In the Pacific Northwest, Washington, that had done this pretty much under control, is seeing big outbreaks. Uh, Idaho is blowing up, and California has had a huge number of cases and has even moved back. And that gets us to Oregon. Well, Oregon is still, has Far fewer cases than most states. We're the seventh lowest attack rate, the seventh lowest death rate. So even though it seems bad in Oregon now adding two, three, four hundred cases a day, it's still much better than in the rest of the of the country. We're seeing more deaths every day, two to six deaths a day. Uh, and you know, when you look at the deaths in the last few weeks, you're starting to see 40 years old, 50s year old, 60 year olds with without underlying conditions. That's a real worry as we start to see these younger deaths occur. Uh, in Douglas County, this has been far and away our most active week. Uh, you know, we reported 20 new confirmed cases yesterday, uh, seven uh, today. We're going to report a bunch new tomorrow. So it's still very, very, very active here in Douglas County. Now, Douglas County, if we were a state, we'd still have the lowest rate in the country. So as much as this seems like we've got a lot of disease here, we really don't. I was on the phone just a few minutes ago, and the reason I'm a little late, with the people from Umatilla County. So Umatilla County, 77,000 people. So a much smaller county than ours, about three-quarters the size of our county. They have 1,500 cases. 1,500 cases. They have 15 deaths. Their nursing home is, is full of sick people. Their hospitals, full of sick people, 16 hospitalizations. They've got um, a bunch of the hospital staff who is sick. So really all around us, we're seeing lots of disease and lots of problems. And what I worry about is there's a, this increasing call for going back to lockdown. And that code doesn't mean like phase one, bars are only going to be open until 10 o'clock. This means closing all but essential businesses. And I'm really, really worried that if we don't get this under control in the next one or two weeks, this is going to happen. When we look at our cases here, about half are from the Norris Farms outbreak. 
These are, it's in all kinds of different people, but in general, people who are seasonal workers who came from other areas uh, were probably already infected with the disease but not showing symptoms and got here and then started having symptoms and infected people around them. Again, we don't think it was mostly people on the farm. We think it's mostly people who they congregated with outside of the farm, either in carpooling, getting back and forth, or in uh, congregate living settings, since most of these people are living multiple to a room. So this is what happened. But half of the cases have nothing to do with that. Half of the cases have to do with what the people at the state call flagrantly infectious behaviors. So these are people who know they're positive, who continue to attend parties in church. These are people who come from an area where there's a lot of disease. And in fact, they've been exposed to disease, and yet they come back to Oregon and expose others. These are people who uh, are bar hopping. These are people going to multiple parties over the space of a few days and exposing lots of people. Um, so I, I just have to pray that people will take this seriously. I mean, if we get to the situation where, we're, where they're at in Umatilla, at this point, they have given up on control in Umatilla, and they're just letting this circulate, and apparently it's just horrific. Uh, you know, people who are older and sick are just frightened staying home. Nobody's wanting to go out or do anything because there's so much disease around. And the hospitals and the other businesses are really getting pummeled. So please, 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 we can do it. And so what are we asking people to do? Well, it's the same kind of things about social distancing. It's the same kind of things about wearing a mask. It's the same kind of things with staying home when you're sick. But in addition, you know, the social distancing is about not going to a party. It's impossible to socially distance at a party. So please, please see if you can delay parties. It's also about travel. Again, so many of our cases are related to travel. Now, I'll, I'll say, I, I think I'll remember them all. Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Utah, California, Nevada, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and Michigan. Other than that, um, you know, that's almost, almost half of our cases by case counts have been associated with travel outside of the state. So please, please, please be careful about travel. We do not have travel restrictions in Oregon. We do not have quarantine, but I could see them happening if we continue to have so many out of cases, out of state cases. So please think about delaying travel. If you go somewhere and come back, please quarantine. Please don't just rush back to work the next day. We've had several examples where people have gone somewhere else, got infected, come back, work for a couple of days, and infect all the people at work here. So if you do have to travel, what I really recommend is that you take another two weeks in quarantine when you get back so you won't now infect everybody at work. So there's a couple of questions. Um, one is about community spread. Could you explain what community spread is? So, so community spread is when we have a case that we can tie back to a previous one. So, um, you know, if you were around, if you were in a workplace and one person in the workplace had it, the first case may be community spread, but the other ones tied to that workplace are called are part of the workplace outbreak. We really worry about ones that are community spread, also called sporadic cases, because that means we're not sure where it came from. And those are really worrisome. We really like to keep those down to an absolute minimum. And we generally have, but in this last week, there were a couple of cases and it was hard to know where it comes from. And why is that? Well, one is that they may have gotten at a place with a very mild contact. We think, however, that many of the cases where people are fully forthcoming with their contacts. And we understand this happens. So, for example, we were told about a party at a place in Douglas County, a big party, lots of kids, probably some underage drinking, probably some other activities you wouldn't want to tell your parents or the people from public health. So people have been really vague about that contact. And, and we know that teenagers are not always going to fess up to, to the stuff that they're doing, which may be wrong, but we have to bring down the number of cases because once you get so much sporadic spread, it's going to be really impossible to keep this under control. It is still well under control in Douglas County. We are totally not out of control. But when I see Umatilla County, when I see Walla Walla County, uh, when I see some of the counties in Southern California, I really worry that this could spin out of control in the next few weeks unless we do really 
stringent behaviors to try and do it down. So I'm not asking people to be monks. I'm not asking people to stay at home all by yourself, but really limit the number of people you're around. Really limit these parties. If you do have to go to a party, please do it outdoors because almost all the spread we've seen has been related to parties that were both indoors and outdoors, and we think the transmission occurred probably indoors. We've seen a bunch of cases related to Fourth of July parties. We see some cases that probably are related to the graffiti crews, so we really, really worry about those big gatherings. The next question we had over this time was about the vaccine uptake. So there's some suggestion that you need to have 50 to 70 percent coverage to keep this disease in abeyance, and yet maybe only 50 percent of the people will use the vaccine, and we know the vaccine won't be 100 percent effective. So will there still be some effect even if the vaccine isn't 100 percent effective? effective and if everybody doesn't use it? Absolutely. So even at lower levels, the vaccine will help to prevent disease, to eradicate disease, to get the disease down to uh, where we were in the past with no cases in a week or two. We are going to have ve- we're, we are going to have to have very high levels of immunity. But still, even at lower levels, it will help. I signed up to be in one of the vaccine trials. I don't know if they'll pick somebody so, so old as me, but um, but I, I signed up to be because I think we need to do it. A um, couple of other questions. Oh, this was this is the same question. Um, so send in your questions. So uh, we heard that there's a watch party group, so a group of people get together to watch this. Thank you for watching. And if you have comments, please please put them on our Facebook page. We really do look at all the comments and people will recognize that in the day or so after we do this, I go through and I usually respond to the comments. There's some really very smart people out there, so please send in the comments. Um, One of the other things is in the newspaper over the weekend and then on Monday was uh, Dr. Powell had his letter to the governor and then an op-ed. And again, I think, uh, you know, Tim and I talked about this a lot. I think he's a real, really honorable man. Um, but, um, you know, there's a very different approach. So the approach to, the approach that, that uh, Dr. Powell was suggesting was that we go to a mitigation strategy for uh, COVID rather than, a, rather than a containment strategy. So a containment strategy is that you find each case, you find all the contacts, you quarantine people, and you try and prevent the disease from spreading. And that's what we do in these days for diseases like measles. This is what we do when you have meningitis. This is what we do if you have tuberculosis, because each of those diseases is quite serious, and the strategies for containment and, uh, are there. And then there are other diseases that we just do mitigation. So for diseases like norovirus, we know that there's norovirus out there a lot. And we respond to norovirus, but we we don't do much for norovirus unless it's in a vulnerable group, a nursing home, a classroom, a cruise ship, and then we work on it. But otherwise, in the general population, we let it go. And there are other diseases we get let it go, like herpes, we don't do much for, and norovirus. But those are all diseases that have a relatively low mortality rate. The mortality rate from norovirus is vanishingly small. The the death rate from uh, strep is vanishingly small. And so uh, typically we use that kind of mitigation strategy for diseases that have very few hospitalizations and no deaths. COVID, however, is pretty serious. I mean, it's got a case fatality rate somewhere between a half and and 1%. That means that between half and 1% of people who get it, a thousand times more dangerous than norovirus. Uh, And um, it's a disease that, in addition to the people who die, there are a lot of people with long ICU stays, and there are a lot of people with long-term symptoms. Uh, in addition, we don't think there's a, any cure on the horizon for strep or, or uh, norovirus, but we think there's some very good things right on the horizon for, for COVID. And I'm not sure which it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be a biologic. I don't know if it's going to be a treatment. I don't know if it's going to be an antiviral. I don't know if it's going to be a vaccine. But I think we've certainly put a lot of money into it and a lot of time into finding one of those. So given the fact that there, are, there is a treatment in the future, given the fact that other countries show that you really can nearly eradicate this disease, and given the fact that this disease has a high death rate and a high hospitalization rate, 
Oregon has continued to use the containment strategy, as has every state in the United States, and as every uh, state, every every other country, except perhaps Sweden and Brazil, but almost every other country and every other state has chosen a, chosen a containment strategy rather than simply a mitigation strategy. So that's what it is. I'm sure there are going to be people who don't always agree. So the question is, are the positive cases counted as Douglas County or from their home county? So the story is if they were, uh, if they have actually an address in another uh, county, then they get counted in that other county. Mo many of the people who are in the Norris Farms are, are migrants, so they go from place to place to place and do not have a place of, of official residence. And so they go from place to place. In those cases, they get counted in Douglas County. If they do have a firm residence in another area, then it gets counted there. Yeah, so somebody says, with test results being two weeks out, how can we get a grasp on tracing contacts since that doesn't begin until the positive test results return? That is a very good question. So many of the positive cases we're having now are, um, are what we call uh, contacts of previous cases. So let's say there's, a, there's a, a, a father who is sick and then the wife gets sick. Uh, even before her test, we know that she's a presumptive case and we do the contact tracing at that point. The other thing that's happening is there are these antigen tests and NovaCare is doing those. And those, until today, those antigen tests have been a presumptive case. So when we got even back a positive antigen test, the conf confirmatory test may not come back for two weeks. But we had pretty sure they had it and we did all the contact tracing then. There have been a few cases where people have been sick, gone in, got the test, the test results don't come back for two weeks. We didn't, we had no clue that they had it then, and then they got the test results back two weeks, which is after their isolation period. You're right, in that case, tracing the contacts is very difficult, and that's where we think we could see some community spread. We're working with a different lab now to see if we can get the results back sooner. We're working, we're allowed to work with the state lab on a limited number of tests. They usually get theirs back within a day or two, which is great. And now those antigen tests, which in the past were considered only preliminary tests as of this afternoon, are now going to be uh, confirmatory, confirmed tests. So that good news is we won't have to wait two weeks for those results. Okay, so Kelsey says, how many responses did I get to the perfect announcement format? So you remember, there were two challenges. One was, if you were the governor for a day, what would you do? Not what would you not do, but what would you do? And we had one response to that, and that was about the, the masks. And actually, the governor saw that and uh, took that up. The second was about the perfect announcement strategy. So again, if you were going to write the announcement that we do every day, what would be the perfect one? And although we have a lot of comments about it, I don't think we've got a single perfect announcement format, but still open. So if you see what we pronounce every day, produce every day and think you could improve on that, please let us know and tell us how we could improve. So Kat says, how do we become part of vaccine trial? I don't know how I got invited for this. I think I got invited because I was a blood donor, um, but I got invited to be part of the vaccine trial, and uh, you know, I had to ask a bunch of questions and what, answer a bunch of questions and whatever. And we'll see, but I'll find out. Okay, okay. So I get this question probably five times a week, and so let me answer it again. Is COVID more deadly than the flu? Aren't there more deaths from the flu? Absolutely. Positively, not. So the deaths from the flu, when they do them every year, are from a group of diseases we call flu and pneumonia. So what they do is they look every year at the, at the, at the ebbs and flow of deaths from that. And it's a very nice sinusoidal curve with peaks every winter and troughs every summer. What they'll do is they look at the number of deaths outside of that normal expected amount, and those are the deaths that they say are attributed to flu and pneumonia. If you actually measured, actually measured the deaths according to flu because they had a positive flu test and then they died, the number is much lower than that 50 or 80,000 number. It's more like about 10,000. 
Similarly, when we, with, with COVID, we're not counting all the other deaths with COVID for people who don't get tested. We're only talking about people who are very sure they have the disease. When you compare them in an equal way, COVID is 20 times more deadly than the flu. 20 times more deadly than the flu. I can say it again, 20 times more deadly than the flu. And any of us who've been in the hospital recognizes that the flu is bad. We have flu clinics all the time. I'm forever harping on people to get flu vaccines. We're telling people about, about uh, keeping safe from that. But COVID is 20 times more deadly than the flu. And let's think of it. In the very worst flu year, we have 50 or 80,000 deaths. We've already had 140,000 deaths. And this is only in a very short period. And so, yes, it's... COVID and flu are similar in some ways, but COVID is so much more deadly. You never line up refrigerator trucks for the seasonal flu. Now, the 1918 flu was deadly, uh, and so that's what we're trying to prevent. The stories of the great influenza and the deaths from that were just horrific. So is COVID more deadly than the flu? 20 times more. Aren't there more deaths from the flu? Absolutely, positively not. There are 20 times more deaths from COVID than the flu. So it's safe for us to do a spin class with a mask on? Yes. Um, this week, they put the additional recommendations in that people use face coverings even during strenuous activity. That was based on some reports that suggested that with strenuous activity, six feet is probably not enough or may not be enough, and how long is enough. It was really hard to tell, so that's the recommendation to do it. So I usually do a spin class on Saturday, and I expect to go tomorrow with my fashionable balaclava. Um, so our cases of the VA being counted in our county total, and so the story is that the VA is again done by the county of residence. So if a uh, Jefferson County person comes to the VA and gets tested, gets counted in Jefferson County. If it's a Douglas County resident, gets tested to the VA, it gets counted at in Douglas County. Yeah. So is it a myth that people are in line for testing, leave without testing, but still get a positive letter and are counted? So, yeah, there was a question last uh, on our last session that this happened, and I tracked this down. I talk with the person involved, and they talk with the people involved, and we can't find out who this was. We can't get a copy of the letter. And since I can find out everybody who has been tested or has gotten a positive result, we just can't find this out. And when we looked, there, is a, there are almost identical stories in multiple places around the country suggesting that this is one of these internet tropes. But I don't know. So if anybody knows that, I'm actually offering a reward. So we have a third challenge now. I'm actually offering a reward, a $50 reward out of my own pocket for anyone who can show me evidence that this has ever happened. So there's a chance to make 50 bucks. So uh, how's Eugene doing? I have a doctor appointment there next week. Well, Eugene is in about the same situation we are. They're continuing to have an uptick in cases. They especially are having cases associated with kids coming back to the U of O. Again, you know, if you go to a doctor's appointment, stay in the car, go into the office and do that, I think that's still pretty safe. But, you know, as we start getting higher and higher and higher parts of amounts of disease, it's going to start getting less and less safe. So please do the things I asked before. Yeah, so Rena says, what's your opinion on closing state borders for a while? Well, you know, a bunch of other states have noted this interstate travel as a, as a source of infection. So I heard New York is imposing a 14-day quarantine on new people. That's really darn hard to do. You know, tracking people down at the airport, tracking where they're going to be, having somebody check on them to be sure they're in quarantine. So requiring quarantine is really quite difficult. You can ban interstate travel by the Constitution. Um, but what we can ask people to do is, if you do go away, quarantine when you get back quarantine for two weeks. If you can't do two weeks, do a week. But when you go back, quarantine, don't go right back to work. Because when you go right back to work, that's the time you're light, most likely to be infectious and most likely to infect all of your other people. And I, I don't know, we've talked about five of those this morning where, you know, people in another area where there's a lot of disease come to Oregon, infect the people along the way. Yeah. So do I have information about the Switzerland article? Um, 
Yeah. So the Switzerland article was interesting. There was a there was a it sounds like a bar restaurant, and in the bar restaurant, some people wore masks. Uh, some of the servers wore masks. Some of the servers wore masks and face shields, and some of the people just wore wore face shields. The only people who get sick were the people who had just the face shields. So the question is, does the face shields help as much as the mask? And I don't know. It was a relatively small number. There was only a, a dozen or so people. And so you can't really be, you know, it could have just been luck, right? It could be that people were more gregarious or more likely to wear face shields, and those of us who are more shy are going to wear masks or whatever. But it was intriguing. And so what happens in a new thing like this What's going to happen is somebody say, well, we had an outbreak, and that's not what we found. We found that everybody was equally likely, and then you'll get a sense of whether this is true or not. But again, remember the shields are not mostly to protect you, which is what it was in this case, but it was to protect others. And we think face shields actually may be even a little bit more effective in protecting others. The other thing that's good is when you have the face shield on, it's really hard to touch your face. And so, you know, you try and scratch your eyes and you realize that it's hard to do. Over the next few weeks, we're going to try some other new and innovative face protections. So you'll see as we do these, when these arrive via Amazon, we'll do those. Yeah, so what is the likelihood the virus can cause long-term damage in children? Well, this virus is still relatively new, so we don't know. One of the things that is pretty worrisome is that when you look at heart scans of people who had moderate disease, their heart scans are not normal uh, weeks and months after the disease. So that's a worry that you could that adults at least will get long term uh, long term damage. And lung damage is very interesting. In China, early on, they didn't also didn't have enough PCR testing. So the way they did rapid testing for people for COVID was they did chest CTs. They did a lot of chest CTs. So you'll see, if you look back on the, on the data, there's a big spike in the number of cases on February 15th or so in China. And that was because they, on that day, included all of the um, CT cases. What they found was a lot of kids who were mildly symptomatic or even asymptomatic had had abnormal chest CTs. Now, abnormal chest CTs don't necessarily say that you have lung damage, but it is not a good thing to have an abnormal chest CT. An abnormal chest CT means the changes that you have there are big enough to be seen, and so that is a worry. We are really looking for the longer-term studies. The China, I, I imagine since China had the first outbreak, we'll get those. The four-month follow-up of people who had disease at that time and I'm hoping what they're going to do is put some of those people who had disease, both mild disease, moderate disease, and severe disease, through a bunch of tests. What are their pulmonary functions like? What are their oxygen levels like? What is their memory like? What is their brain function like to see if they're going to be long-term sequelae of the disease? I've not seen that good study yet, but I think it's probably forthcoming. Yeah, so Deborah says, are there safety protocols set up for migrant workers before they can work? I don't know about other places, but it, at the farm here, they had great protections at the farm. They had spacing, they had hand washing, they had, they did sort of everything. They did a lot of testing before people got there. And so we think at the farm, things work well. The problem with seasonal workers is they tend to, you know, be come together in families, so there's a lot of spread there. For many seasonal workers, uh, they travel with the same family, so it's like a group, or there are families you haven't seen in a year and they get together and, and do things like get together. And we think it's the get-togethers rather than the work is probably where most of this disease spread. So how is the hospitalized person doing? I don't think we can do specifics, but I think the answer is better. Okay. So this is another one of those things, Stacia. It says, can you clarify the myth regarding how hospitals report COVID deaths? Do they get more money or are they listing COVID deaths when it's not? Look, they're not listing things as COVID when it's not. I mean, there is such scrutiny about hospital billing that you would be an absolute fool to, to uh, uh, you'd be an absolute fool to alter your billing to say COVID when it wasn't. Now, 
many of the people who have COVID have so much else going on, right? They have kidney disease that goes on, their kidneys fail, they have all these clotting problems so that they wind up, people wind up with strokes and amputations. There are people who wind up with encephalitis. And so there are a lot of people who have COVID who have other things. They still have COVID and they still die because of the COVID. If they didn't have the COVID, they wouldn't have had those other things. And yes, it gets counted as, as a death with COVID. Now, the average length of stay for somebody who dies of COVID in the hospital is very long. So this week, I've been looking at the people and the time they were diagnosed and the time they died is frequently three to four weeks. So many of these people had a long time in the hospital. Remember, our case here had over 100 days in the ICU. Nick Cordero, a young, a young dancer who just recently died, three months in the ICU, on dialysis, lost a leg, needed a lung transplant. So COVID really is a terrible disease. Hospitals do get more money for COVID because it just takes more money to take care of COVID. That's the way every hospital gets paid for everything. So if you go in with a, a simple appendicitis, you get a certain amount of money. If you go in for a heart transplant, you get more money because heart transplants are much more complicated than a simple appendicitis. And that's the way we've been paying hospitals for 30 years. So the fact that hospitals get more money for COVID, not shocking because COVID is much more serious than your typical community-acquired pneumonia. So what are my thoughts on, on attending church that have space seating and mask use? Well... Uh, you know, the, the, the safest kind of church would be outdoor church. And we've actually had a couple of the places here do outdoor churches because outdoors are always safer than indoors. If you are going to be indoors, having spaced seating is a good thing. Having mask use is a good thing. Limiting the number of people who are singing is a good thing. Uh, good ventilation is a good thing. So are face shields really comparable to a mask? Well, so face shields and masks are different and they are comparable. Uh, masks obviously don't protect your eyes. Masks are of varying quality so that they have more permeability. But since they're closer to your mouth and don't allow the air to come in and around are uh, different. Face shields have the advantage that they also cover your eyes and we think the eyes are a significant portal for disease. It's hard to touch your face so that's a good thing. And they're totally impervious, right? There's no way to cough through the mask. Now, they do have more air movement around the sides. And in terms of total protection, they are comparable. There's an article in JAMA a few weeks ago that looked at the difference, and it was like one of those point-counterpoint things. And I think in the end, both are good. And, then, and again, the difference between mask and face shields is this much. The difference between no mask or nothing is enormous. So... You know, if you want to use one or the other, please use one of them. And again, there are some people who can't use masks. They either have an aversion to something covering their face or they may have a very low airflow. This comes nowhere near obstructing airflow. So Kenny says, because we've had such a focus on personal sanitation and social distancing, do you think we may have a more cold, mild cold and flu season? Boy, I sure hope so. Right, because if every time somebody gets the flu, we worry that they have COVID, this is going to be really hard. So we're working really hard this year to get as many people a flu vaccine as we can. And I think, yes, we may see a milder uh, cold and flu season. So Kat says, is an oximeter... Uh, or thermometer more indicative of a possible infection if somebody knew their baseline level? Well, they want measure two th- different things. So the oximeter, that little thing that fits on your finger, measures your oxygen level, and the thermometer obviously measures your temperature. Temperature usually comes up early in the disease. So usually in the first, second, third day of the disease, you'll start, start to have a little bit of fever, and that would be more indicative of infection early. There are very, very, very few people going to have abnormal oxygen levels in the first three days. But by the seventh or eighth day of illness, um, you presumably already know you have the disease, by the seventh or eighth day of the illness, people start to get shorter of breath. And without the oximeter, it's pretty hard to know how short of breath you are. So one of the things that's been striking about this this pandemic are stories that people who come in, uh, people come into the hospital 
and they say they're a little short of breath and some perfectly normal oxygen levels, but then others have incredibly low oxygen levels and the people don't really have differential amounts of, of uh, distress. So um, what I would uh, suggest is that early on the thermometer will tell you if you have fever. Later on, the oximeter will tell you you have oxygen desaturation. When we have a case, we give people both. Yeah, somebody says, where did we get this? So somebody gave it to me. I will try and find out exactly where it came from. Somebody gave me this to try. And it's been great, actually. It's one of my favorites. Okay, well, a couple of other things, you know, is, the, is, the, is, is about schools. So I'm on the Healthy Schools Reopening thing. And there's been a lot of talk about, um, there's been a lot of talk about reopening schools. And I think... Uh, there's a lot on both sides, right? So I, I've told people the story that within one hour I got a story, uh, an email that said that if we let kids go back to school and anybody gets sick or dies, the blood would be on my hands. And then in the next hour I got one that said if, if we didn't open school, society would collapse and that, and that failure of society would be on my back. So it was like, oh my God, I'm really, I'm really in the middle of this. So this is what I know, and I've been working on this very a lot, probably 30 hours this week already, on the school reopening thing. The, uh, there are other places in the world that have reopened schools. Most have done well, but some have had troubles. So, for example, Israel opened schools and had troubles. Germany opened high schools and had troubles. Korea opened high schools and had troubles. So I think what we've seen are a couple of things. One is school reopenings did well when there was a very low rate of disease. And the very low rate of disease is about where we were in May. You know, we'd go a week without a case. So if we had one case a week in Douglas County. In the places that opened schools when you were at that level, they did fine. We also found that places that did elementary schools did fine. Um, and we found out that, uh, that when, kids got, when kids get ill, especially kids who are less than 10, they spread it, but less so than older kids. So once you start to hit towards puberty, you spread it just like an adult. So high schools are especially dangerous. And I think people who've been watching this know that for eight weeks or so, I've been saying, I don't quite figure out how we're going to do high schools. But the younger grades, especially K, K1, 2, and 3, have been in all the places that have opened uh, the safest. So I don't know what's going to happen with schools. I think at the current rate of disease, we really can't open schools. I mean, we're spending all of our time now tracking down these cases and these outbreaks. There is just no way to track down a case or an outbreak at a school because that's going to take a lot of work. So we would get it into this current level of disease. We will have outbreaks in the schools. And so I think at this point, uh, we probably have too much disease to open schools. Anyway, I hear there's going to be an announcement next week. I'll let you know then. Yeah. So what's the current feeling about how long before we have an effective vaccine and enough people to get the vaccine to change the course of this? Well, this is all really complicated. So first is, are we going to get a vaccine? And there are four vaccines out there. There's one that's starting in phase three trials. So it's going to be a little while to do that. But then it's going to be a while until they can make enough doses. So I heard one of these vaccines, they're going to have 100 million doses. Well, that sounds like a lot of doses. But it's going to take three doses to get full immunity. I said, okay, well, that means with three doses, that's 33 million people can get vaccinated. There's 330 million people in this country. So that means only 10% of the people could be vaccinated with that. Uh, you know, I think Dr. Fauci said early on that it's likely to be a year or a year and a half when he said this in March. So I think it's going to be a year or a year and a half starting in March. And so I think we're going to have a, a sort of a, a bleak winter. But I'm hoping that comes springtime and the, and the new flowers come up, that we also have a good vaccine, that enough people get vaccinated it comes down. But it may not be just a vaccine that ends this. Uh, there may be, for example... Uh, a very effective treatment. Imagine if you could have a treatment that was effective as antibiotics are for pneumonia. So pneumonia used to be a really bad disease. You know, people would get pneumonia. It would go, th you know, they would get it in a nursing home and they would mostly die. Young people would get it. Some would die, some would rally. Uh, but then we got antibiotics and now we don't ever expect a young person to die of pneumonia. 
So imagine if we had a really effective antiviral drug, not remdesivir, but something more effective than remdesivir, so that when you started in the hospital, when you got it, you could get this when you went to the urgent care or went to your doctor's office and not get ever so sick. That would, that would change this from a disease that you have to get rid of every case to a disease that you could treat as it came up. Let's say there was a really effective preventive medicine. So there's a really effective preventive medicine for HIV. If you get injected with this medicine once a month, you basically are not going to get HIV. And so imagine if you had this drug that you could inject. It could be a biologic or some other kind of drug that we don't even know about yet that would work. So I, I think it's going to end one of those ways. Either we're going to get a good, good vaccine, we're going to get a good preventive treatment, we're going to get a good active treatment. So I think how it's going to go. Yeah. So why aren't all homeless people sick and in the hospital? I mean, they're not wearing masks or washing their hands. Well, um, we other places have seen outbreaks among the homeless, especially when they're in shelters. And again, because they're inside and congregate. Again, most homeless people live outside. And uh, outside is so much safer than inside. And uh, homeless people are frequently wary of other people. They're frequently uh, uh, skittish about too much contact. So, um, um, so I think they have just less contact, and uh, that's why they're not getting it. So what's the word on pool testing? Any chance I'll get my Christmas wish? So for those who've been watching, my Christmas wish is a simple saliva-based test that you could spit in the morning, take your shower, get out, and look to see if you had it, and that everybody would do that every day. And even if that test wasn't perfect, we would know very quickly who was infected, and those people who were infected, then we could, we could trace their contacts, and we could get rid of this in one month. So Dr. Fauci was doing this nerd-like podcast, and he talked about the $1 saliva test, which is really what I want for Christmas. And so that everybody, and, and you could then get me for Christmas 365 of these, and then I would do these each day, and we would get them done. There's no chance I'm going to get it for this Christmas, but the hope is that uh, sometime soon. So I will tell you, saliva testing is progressing. There's actually a group of U at University of Oregon who is, who is trying to get certified a saliva test. So what they have to do is, on the same day, test somebody's nasal swab, the nasopharyngeal swab, which is the deep one, and a saliva test to see how well the three correlate. Uh, so they may actually be down here this weekend collecting specimens to see if they can correlate. They have a lot of negative specimens. They're looking for some positives. But I think there's a chance that I may get this for my birthday. Um, so I was sick in January, February, and just got a negative antibody test. Is it just the crud? Yeah, so the antibody tests are not perfect, but... The more we've looked at this, there was not very much disease in Oregon in January, and there was probably just a little bit in February. So people who were sick in January and February, it probably just was the crud. We had, early on, five positive antibody tests. I don't think we've had a positive antibody test in a month. So that really all of those people who we recommended to get a test to see if this was COVID or just the crud, um, they, they, we actually didn't get antibodies. Now, one of the things that we have noticed over the years is that, over the months, is that people who do have high levels of antibodies right after the, the disease, that within three to four months, those levels of antibodies decrease and sometimes decrease be, be below the detectable level. However, so if you were sick in January and got the test in July, it's possible that the antibodies already faded. But we don't think there's any way to know for sure about that. Yeah, so there was something about a, a mask-reducing disease severity. I tried to find that, and I couldn't, figure, I couldn't figure that out. I think once you have the disease, I don't think that a mask is going to change it. But I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find that. Yeah, darn it. So this is a question. Any word on students singing in a choir? Is there anything more wonderful than listening to kids sing? Um, yeah, K to fifth grade music, singing, dancing, and shared instrument based. Well, we do know that among older people, that singing is an especial risk factor. And it's probably because those singers have such great breath control 
that they spew this stuff out for a long way. And the, you know, the Skagit choir where 50, over 50 of 62 people got infected suggests that it's, it's pretty contagious. And there are a bunch of other stories where people singing, chanting, or shouting do, do tend to spread the virus more. I think music, um, maybe piano, uh, I don't know. So what's the turnaround time for the test? Well, the tests vary. So the antigen test, the turnaround time is just a few minutes, which is great. They're not quite as accurate. The Abbott test is out there. We have limited number of cartridges. Their turnaround time is less than an hour. Uh, there are the tests that we can get to set to the state lab for high priority. We're getting those back in a day or two or three. And then there are the tests that we're sending to commercial laboratory, in this case, Quest and LabCorp, those are taking over a week. And so the turnaround time is, is really quite variable. It really has to be down to a day or two for us to know what's going on. So a child was exposed to someone who tested positive, then went to sports practice, and all teammates gave him a hug. Ooh. Should the entire team be in quarantine? Well, we should do the investigation. It's a, it's a little more, you know, in contact or exposed to means different things for epidemiologists and others. So we should certainly know about that. So if you could uh, privately message us with the person's name, then we'll see if we can go ahead and figure out uh, if it's right. Now, I will tell you, Almost every day, and sometimes multiple times in a day, I'll get a story that, oh, so-and-so is positive and they can't work for the next two weeks. And I'll say, well, that doesn't sound right. I haven't heard about that case. And then we'll check, and it's really not a case. Uh, so I had two of those today. So not everybody says they're positive is positive. Sometimes I don't know what the motive is. Yeah. So we had better not go into another lockdown. We are ready to just get on with life. Not one thing they are doing to prove this virus is true. Facts. Well, I mean, this virus is true. I mean, I saw that the other day that, oh, there's no, you know, this, this whole virus is a hoax. I mean, do you really think you get every country in the world, every state in the union, and the president, and Fauci, and Birks and all those people to do something which is a total hoax. I mean, it's not. Now, the story about being in lockdown, we don't have to do that. I and mean, if people will do the things not to spread this, this, would, this, this will not spread and we will not need to go into lockdown. But people have to be really careful about bar hopping. They have to be really careful about these parties. And they have to be really careful about, uh, about travel. I mean... I mean, these are real deaths here. I mean, I, these are 140,000 people in this country who are dead, 200 and some odd in Oregon who are really dead. And, uh, you know, you only have to look at our guy from the VA, and he wasn't faking it. Yeah, so is there possible that as time goes by, this virus will change to become more or less aggressive or more or less dangerous? So viruses do change all the time. And so they change a little bit. There are some viruses that change a lot, like the flu virus and the HIV virus changes a lot. Uh, there are some viruses that don't ever change at all, like measles is a remarkably stable virus. Chickenpox is a remarkably stable virus. And how do we know? Well, the reason we know that chickenpox is a remarkably stable virus is that, you know, if I'm 100 years old, I'm not quite, but if I was 100 years old and had the shingles, that virus is the virus I got when I was five years old in kindergarten, and then I carry that virus with me the whole time, and it still could be cultured from the shingles that I get. So if I got shingles and you look at that virus and then look at the virus that, that modern-day kids get, it's exactly the same. Similarly, we have some of the measles virus from before they made the vaccine and the now, and it's almost exactly the same. So, vi so some viruses change a lot, some viruses change a little. This one changes a moderate amount. It has in it a gene that proofreads. So it makes a protein, it proofreads it to be sure it's this okay. If it's not okay, it discards that and makes another one. So this one does not uh, mutate that much, but it mutates a little bit. So we know that it's mutated one time, 
uh, in the in the 614 spot. And what that does is that makes this actually more virulent because the spike protein, which is the protein that attaches to the human cells, used to be connected by sort of a flimsy little part and would frequently break apart. The new connection is much sturdier, and so we think that this new one is a little bit more infectious than the previous. Sometimes, uh, sometimes there's mutations that make it less virulent, and sometimes that happens. Although I will tell you that generally the less virulent ones don't make it, and so they don't infect people and they kind of die out. The ones that are more virulent are much more likely to survive. Okay, so I told people the last time that I would look into the pepsid. Remember, pepsid, which is a uh, antacid, otherwise known as famotidine, uh, was noted in China to be associated with less severe outcomes. And then in the U.S., it was just a very small study that looked at uh, famotidine, and it looked like it might be helpful. There was a study, it was put together, apparently that study has just not done well at all. They've had a hard time recruiting people. There have been all kinds of troubles with the study. So as at least of this afternoon, there are no reports on that Pepsid trial. The other one is the budesonide, which is this inhaled steroid. Uh, this inhaled steroid, this is a doctor from uh, Plano, Texas, who's really into that. His sense is that if you use this early on, it really is magic and everybody gets better. Again, I looked really hard to see if there was any other backing for that, and I can't find it. doesn't mean there isn't. I just couldn't find it. Now, he stated in his thing that in Japan and Iceland, this is what they use all the time, and that's why there's so few illnesses, in, so few deaths in Iceland and Japan. Iceland and Japan didn't use it, so it's a little hard to know what he was, what he was talking about or what happens. I mean, I'd love that. You know, boy, if we had a simple inhaled something or other that made people better and they didn't have to go to the hospital, they didn't have to go to the ICU, they didn't get sick, that would be a game changer, right? Then you'd have to worry so much less about this virus. But I think with the high death rates, and look at you, Matilla, 77,000 people, so three quarters of our size, 15,000 cases. 16 current hospitalizations and 15 deaths. Some of young people, so I consider a young person to be anybody younger than me, so uh, of young people. And so this is really, really, really in, impacting you, Matilla. Let's not go there. Okay, is that it? So that's the questions for tonight. What I would recommend is please, 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 we've not lost control of this yet, especially in Douglas County. So I implore people who are here to do several things. Stay home if you're sick. Really, truly, if you're sick, stay home. There are so, you know, we've had a couple of people. I sick. I thought it was just allergies. There aren't a lot of allergies around in, in, in July, right? So grasses, which really cause a lot of allergies, really by the second week in July, go away. This time in July, if you've never had allergies before, it's pretty unlikely that when you get cough and sneezing that this is allergies. So if you're sick, Please, please, please stay home. The second is socially distance. Social distancing is really all you need to do. If you stay six feet apart, you really don't need to do anything else. Um, you don't have to do the mask. You don't have to do anything else, but stay six feet apart. And to stay six feet apart means it's really hard to go to a party. It's really hard to go to a bar and maintain that, that six feet distancing. The third is um, wear a mask or a face shield. Again, very nice face shield here, easy to use. You can use a mask, easy to use. Really reconsider travel. Really, really, really reconsider travel. With so many of our cases coming from out of area, either reconsider your traveling, or if you do have to travel or somebody else comes in, really have them quarantine for two weeks. Again, let's say you come from the worst place in the world that had all the disease and you're infected. If you come in quarantine for two weeks, at the end of two weeks, you're no longer infectious. And then you can come and go around. So I had a call from a friend yesterday and his girlfriend is in New York and she's tired of being in New York and she wants to come to Oregon. It's like, ooh, that's dangerous. So we talked about precautions on the plane and they're gonna take super duper precautions with a really high quality mask and eye protection. And then when she gets here, they're gonna quarantine for two weeks. Well, so it's possible she, she's a young person, so she could, might get the disease on the plane. Even if she did though, she's gonna come here and quarantine for two weeks and not really spread it to anyone else. And so we think this is a pretty safe arrangement. Now, if the story is, I'm going to go on the plane, put on a flimsy mask that I'm going to wear like this, 
and then sit around with people, chat in the bar on uh, in the in the hotel bar there, and 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 then come and go and visit a big group here. That is not safe, and that's exactly what we've seen in a couple of these clusters. So I feel like banging my head against the wall when we hear that story again about oh I was a little sick, and went to a went to a wedding, or I was a little sick, and went to a party. Those are the kinds of ways that this is going to spread and then it's going to be out of control. And then wash your hands, but especially be kind to others. People have been very kind this week. I know in the rest of the country they're not. Dr. Fauci says he's gotten some some death threats and whatever else. Thank God I've had none of those here, which is great. So let's please be kind. This is a really stressful time for people. Economically, people are challenged. Socially, people are challenged. I think uh, hearing all the stuff that's in the media is very challenging, even for, even for me. And so please do all those things, and I'll see you again next Tuesday. Again, Dr. Bob Danahoff for Public Health Officer from Douglas County. Thank you.